Now, I wish to introduce to the tribunal at this time Mr. Robert M. W. Kempner, uh, who will represent the prosecution in the next phase of the case dealing with the defendant, Frank. May I please the tribunal? There have been distributed to the tribunal and to all defense counsel trial briefs and documents related to the defendant Frick. The trial brief prepared by my colleague Karl Achmann sets forth in great detail evidence both in the form of documents and decrees against the defendant Wilhelm Frick. English translations of the evidentiary material referred to in the trial brief are included in the document book prepared by my colleague, Lieutenant Felton. This book has been marked double L. Defendant Frick's great contribution to the Nazi conspiracy was in the field of governmental administration. He was the administrative brain who devised the machinery of state for Nazism, who geared that machinery for aggressive war. In the course of his active participation in the Nazi conspiracy from 1923 to 1945, Defendant Frick occupied a number of important positions. Document 2978 PS, which has previously been introduced as USA Exhibit Number 8, lists the, the positions in detail. The original was signed by the defendant Frick on October 14, 1945. I do not repeat these positions they are known to the court. Frick's first activity on behalf of the Nazi conspirators was his participation in promoting their rise to power. Frick betrayed in his capacity as law enforcement official of the Bavarian police his own Bavarian government by participating in the Munich Beer Hall Putsch of November 8, 1923. Frick was tried and sentenced together with Hitler on a charge of complicity in treason. His participation in that putsch is described in a record of the proceedings called the Hitler trial before the People's Court in Munich, published in Munich, 1924. I ask the tribunal to take judicial notice of this record of the proceedings. Hitler's appreciation of Frick's assistance is evidenced by the fact that he honored Frick by mentioning his name in Mein Kampf only two other defendants in this proceeding share this honor, namely Hess and Streicher. I ask the tribunal to take judicial notice of the favorable mentioning of defendant Frick in Mein Kampf, German edition, 
1933, page 403. During the period after the Putsch, Frick made further contributions to the Nazi conspiracy. I should like to refer briefly to document 2513 PS, an excerpt of pages 36 and 38 from a report entitled The National Socialist Workers' Party as an Association Hostile to the State and to the Republican Form of Government and Guilty of Treasonable Activity. This report has been previously introduced as document 2513 PS, USA Exhibit 235. It is an official report of the criminal activities of Hitler, Frick, and other Nazis prepared by the Prussian Ministry of the Interior in 1930. It states that Frick, next to Hitler, can be regarded as the most influential representative of the Nazi party at that time. This document reported that at the 1927 party congress in Nuremberg, Frick said that the Reichstag would first be misused by the Nazi party, would then be abolished, and that its abolition would open the way for, that its abolition would open the way for racial dictatorship. The document also reported that Frick stated in a speech in 1929 at Führer that this faithful struggle will first be taken up with the ballot, but this cannot continue indefinitely, for history has taught us that in battle blood must be shed and iron broke back in 1927. Frick's prominent role in helping to bring the Nazis to power was recognized when on January 23, 1930, he was appointed Minister of the Interior and Education in the state of Thuringia. Are you passing from that document now? I thought you were reading from 2513. Uh, now, this is an introduction to the next document. I see. This introduction to the next document I just started with refers to the fact that Adolf Hitler at this time, when Frick was Minister of the Interior in the state of Thuringia, was a stateless alien, not a German citizen. In this capacity, as Minister of Thuringia, the defendant Frick began his manipulations to provide Adolf Hitler the stateless alien with German citizenship, an essential step towards the realization of the Nazi conspiracy. The lack of German citizenship was highly detrimental to the cause of the Nazi party because as an alien, Hitler could not become a candidate for the Reich presidency in Germany. It was a defendant Frick who solved this problem by an administrative maneuver. We now introduce into evidence document 3564 PS, USA Exhibit 709. This document is an affidavit by Otto Meissner of December 27, 1945. Meissner the former State Secretary and Chief of Hitler's Presidial Chancellery says in the last two sentences of this affidavit the following, I quote, Frick also, in collaboration with Klages, Minister of Brunswick, succeeded in naturalizing Hitler as a German citizen in 1932 
by having him appointed a Brunswick government official. This was done in order to make it possible for Hitler to run as candidate for the office of president in the Reich. End of quotation. When Hitler came to power on January 30, 1933, Frick was duly awarded a prominent force in the new regime as Reich Minister of the Imperium. In this capacity, he became responsible for the establishment of totalitarian control over Germany, an indispensable prerequisite for the preparation of aggressive warfare. Frick assumed responsibility for the realization of a large part of the Nazi conspirators' program, both through administration and legislation. I must now explain very briefly the tremendous significance of the Ministry of the Interior in the Nazi state to show the contribution made by Frick to the conspiracy. I offer as evidence of Frick's extensive jurisdiction as Minister of the Interior, document 3475PF, USA Exhibit number 710, which is part of the official German manual for administrative officials, dated 1943. I ask the tribunal to take judicial notice of Frick's jurisdiction mentioned in this document. The names of the men who, according to this document, worked under Frick's supervision, and I stress this point, worked under Frick's supervision, are symbolic. They are listed on page one of the English translation. Here we find, amongst the subordinates of Frick, Reich Health Leader Dr. Conti, Reichsführer SS and Chief of the German Police Heinrich Himmler and Reich Labor Service Leader Hiel. This document shows Frick as supreme commander of three important pillars of the Nazi state, the Nazi Health Service, the Nazi Police System and the Nazi Labor Service. The wide variety of Frick's activities as Reich Minister of the Interior, from the short catalogue of his functions, enumerated on the following page of this manual, he had final, final authority over constitutional questions, drafted legislation, he had jurisdiction over governmental administration, civil defense, and was final arbiter in all questions concerning race and citizenship. The manual also lists sections of the ministry concerned with administrative problems in occupied territories, annexed territories, the new order in the southeast, the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, and the new order in the east. He had also full jurisdiction in the field of civil service, including such matters as appointment, tenure, promotion, and dismissal. The defendant Frick used his white powers as Reich Minister of the Interior to advance the cause of the Nazi conspiracy. To accomplish this purpose, he drafted and signed the laws and decrees which abolished the autonomous state government, the autonomous local government, and the political parties in Germany other than the Nazi party. In 1933 and 1934, the first two years of the Nazi regime, Frick signed about 235 laws or decrees, all of which are published in the Reichsgesetzblatt. I should like to refer briefly to a few of the more important laws and decrees such as the law of July 14, 1933, outlawing all political parties, 
other than the Nazi party? Reichsgesetzblatt 1933, page 479, document 1388A, PS. Then the law of December 1st, 1933, securing the unity of party and state. Reichsgesetzblatt 1933, one page, 1016, document 1395 PS. The law of January 30, 1934, transferring the sovereignty of the German states to the Reich. Reichsgesetzblatt 1934, one page 75, document 306 APS. The German Municipality Act of January 30, 1935, which gave Frick's Ministry of the Interior final authority to appoint and dismiss all mayors of municipalities throughout Germany. Reichsgesetzblatt 1935, 1, page 49, document 2008PS. And finally, the Nazi Civil Service Act of April 7, 1933, which provided that all civil servants must be trustworthy as defined by Nazi standards and also must meet the Nazi racial requirements, published Reichsgesetzblatt 1933, 1 page 175, document 1397PS. One category of Frick's activities, however, deserves special notice. That is, the crushing of opposition by legally camouflaged police terror. This is shown by the book, Dr. Wilhelm Frick and his ministry, our document 3119 PS, which is in evidence, as USA 711, written by Frick's undersecretary and co-conspirator Hans Fundner, apparently written to establish Frick's eternal contribution to the creation of the Nazi Thousand Years Reich. It states, and I quote briefly from page 4, paragraph 4 of the English translation, while Marxism in Prussia was crushed by the hard fist of the Prussian Prime Minister Hermann Göring and the gigantic wave of propaganda was initiated for the Reichstag election of March 3, 1933, Dr. Frick prepared the complete seizure of power in all states of the Reich. All at once the political opposition disappeared all at once, the mine, river, line, was eliminated. And then a little further, from this time on, only one will and one leadership reigned in the German Reich. End of quotation. How was this done? On February 28, 1933, the day after the Reichstag fire, civil rights in Germany were abolished. This decree was published in the Reichsgesetzblatt, 1933, page 83, and an English translation of it appears in the document book as number 1390 PS. I refer to this decree at this time because it carried the signature of the Reich Minister of the Interior Frick. And now something important. It stated at the beginning of the decree, which was published on the morning after the Reichstag fire, that the suspension of civil rights is decreed as a defense measure against communist acts of violence endangering the state. <coughs> at the time of publication of this decree, the Nazi government announced that a thorough investigation had proven that the communists had set fire to the Reichstag building. 
I do not intend to go into the controversial issue who set fire to the Reichstag. But I should like to offer proof that the official Nazi statement that the communists were responsible for the fire was issued without any investigation and that the preamble of the decree which had Frick's signature was a mere subterfuge. I offer into evidence I'm going too fast. You must try and go a little bit slower. Yeah. I offer into evidence a very short excerpt of an interrogation of Defendant Goering, dated October 30, 1945. Our document 3593 PS, USA Exhibit. 712. And I should read, I should like to read the following brief portion beginning on page 4. My question to Goering, how could you tell your press agent one hour after the Reichstag caught fire that the communists did it without investigation? Goering's answer, did the public relations officers say that at that time? My answer, yes. He said you said it. Goering, it is possible. When I came to the Reichstag, the Führer and his gentlemen were there. I was doubtful at that time, but it was their opinion that the communists had started the fire. My question, but you were the highest law enforcement official in a certain sense. Daluc was your subordinate. Looking back at it now, and not in the excitement that was there once, wasn't it too early to say without any investigation that the communists had started the fire? Goering, yes, that is possible. But the Führer wanted it this way. Question, why did the Führer want to issue at once a statement that the communists had started the fire? Answer, he was convinced of it. Question, it is right if I say he was convinced without having any evidence or any proof of that at this moment? Goering, that is right, but you must, must take into account that at that time the communist activity was extremely strong, that our new government as such was not very secure. But, um, Lieutenant Kempler, uh, what has that got to do with Frick? He signed the decree, as I said before, abolishing civil liberties on the other morning, pointing out that it was the communist danger. On the other side, this communist danger was a mere subterfuge and was one of the things which finally led to the Second World War. The defendant Frick not only abolished civil liberties within Germany, but he also became the organizer of the huge police network of the Nazi Reich. Parenthetically, I may state that before this time, there was no unified Reich police system. The individual German states had police forces of their own. I asked the tribunal to take judicial notice of the decree of June 17, 1936, signed by Frick and published in the Reichsgesetzblatt, 1936, page 487. An English translation of this decree is in the document book under the number 2073 PS. Section 1 of this Frick decree reads as follows. For the unification of police duties in the Reich, a chief of German police is instituted in the German Ministry of the Interior 
to whom is assigned the direction and conduct of all police affairs. And from section 2 we learn that it was the defendant Frick and Hitler, the signers of the decree, who appointed Himmler as chief of the German police. Paragraph 2 of section 2 of the decree states that Himmler was, and I quote, subordinated individually and directly to the Reich and Prussian Minister of the Interior, end of quote, that is Frick. The official chart of the German police system, document 1852, which has already been introduced into evidence as USA Exhibit 449, the position of the Reich Minister of the Interior Frick as a supreme commander of the entire German police system, including the notorious RSHA, of which the defendant Carlsen Brunner became chief under Frick in January 1943. Defendant Frick used his authority over the newly centralized police system for the promotion of the Nazi conspiracy. The tribunal may take judicial notice of Frick's decree of September 20, 1936, published in the Ministerial Gazette of the Reich, Ministerialblatt des Reichs und Preußischen Ministeriums des Inners, 1936, page 1343, document 2245. In this decree, Frick reserved for himself the authority to appoint inspectors of the security police subordinated to his district governors, the Oberpräsidenten, and ordered their close cooperation with the party and armed forces. Another example of the use of his activities in the police field is in his ordinance of March 18, 1938, concerning the Austrian Anschluss, in which Frick authorized the Reichsführer of the SS and police, Himmler, to take security measures in Austria without, without regard to previous legal limitations. This decree is published in the Reichsgesetzblatt 1938 page 262 and appears in the document book as 1437 I shall not here repeat the evidence concerning the criminal activities of the German police over which the defendant Frick had supreme authority. I should simply like to refer the tribunal to the presentation already made on the subject of concentration camps the Gestapo, two of the police institutions under Frick's jurisdiction. But I should like to show that not only Himmler's subordinate machine, but also Frick's department itself was familiar with these institutions. Therefore, I now offer an evidence document 1643 PS as USA exhibit. 713. This document is a synopsis of correspondence between the Reich Ministry of the Interior and its field offices from November 1942 through August 1943 and the subject of the legal aspect of the confiscation of property by the SS for the enlargement of the concentration camp at Auschwitz. At the bottom of page one and the top of page two of the English translation, there appears a synopsis of the minutes of a meeting held on December 17th and 18th, 1942, concerning the confiscation of this property. These minutes indicate 
that a further discussion was to be held on the subject on December 21st, 1942, between the representative of the Reich Minister of the Interior and the Reichsführer SS. On page two, there appears also a summary of a teletype letter dated January 22, 1943, from Dr. Hoffmann, representing the Reich Minister of the Interior to the district governor in Katowice. The summary begins as follows, and I quote, the territory of the Auschwitz concentration camp will be changed into an independent estate, which means an administrative territory of itself. The fact that the defendant Frick demonstrated, de demonstrated personal interest in a concentration camp became known through the testimony of Dr. Blaha, to which I should like to refer the tribunal, and in which he testified that Frick visited the Dachau camp in 1943. The next aspect of the participation of defendant Frick in the Nazi conspiracy concerns his promotion of racial persecution and racism involving the wiping out of the Jews. In addition to the many other responsibilities of Frick, his vast administrative empire covered the entire area of the enactment and administration of racial legislation. I refer again to document 3475PF, the manual for German administrative officials previously introduced. And I refer to pages two and four, showing that Frick was administrative and legislative guardian and protector of the German race. In order to avoid any repetition, I shall not quote the various acts drafted by Frick's ministry against the Jews. The presentation concerning persecution of the Jews made by Major Walsh before the Christmas recess listed a number of decrees signed by Frick, including the infamous Nuremberg laws and the laws depriving Jews of their property, their rights of citizenship, and stigmatizing them with the yellow star. But the activities of Frick's ministry we are not restricted to the commission of such crimes camouflaged in the form of legislation. The police field offices subordinate to Frick participated in the organization of such terroristic activities as a program of November 9, 1938. I refer to a series of Heydrich orders and reports concerning the organization of these programs, or as they were termed by Heydrich, spontaneous riots. Document 305-1PS and 305-8PS, already in evidence as USA Exhibit 240 and 508. Three days after this program, of November 9, 1938, Frick, his undersecretary Stucker, and his subordinate Heydrich and Dalüge participated in a conference on the Jewish question under the chairmanship of the defendant Göring. At this meeting, the various measures were discussed which the individual governmental departments should initiate against the Jews. <coughs> a stenographic record of this meeting, document 1816PS, is already in evidence as USA Exhibit 261. May I briefly refer to one sentence <coughs> to the bottom of page 23 of the English translation, where we find Goering's concluding remarks. Also, the Ministry of the Interior 
and the police will have to think over what measures have to be taken. <coughs> this remark shows that Goering regarded it as strict duty to follow up by administrative devices the program organized <coughs> by Frick's own subordinates. In the foregoing presentation, we have shown that the defendant Frick, as a member of the conspiracy, devised the machinery of the state for Nazis. In the following presentation, we will show that Frick acti actively supported the preparation of the Nazi state for war. <coughs> May we begin this portion by showing that Frick was in sympathy with the flagrant violations by Germany of her treaties of non-aggression. This is clearly shown by the affidavit of Ambassador Messersmith, document 2385 PS, previously introduced as USA Exhibit 68. <coughs> I shall quote only one sentence from this affidavit, page 4, line 10. It reads as follows. <coughs> High-ranking Nazis, with whom I had to maintain official contact, particularly men such as Göring, Goebbels, Lay, Frick, Frank, Daré, and others, repeatedly scoffed at my position as to the binding character of treaties and openly stated to me that Germany would observe her international undertakings only so long as it suited Germany's interest to do so. In May 1935, by his appointment as general plenipotentiary for the administration of the Reich, Frick became one of the big three in charge of preparing Germany for war. The other two members of the Triumvirate were the chief of the OKW and the general plenipotentiary for economy, at that time the defendant Schach. Frick has admitted that he held the position of general plenipotentiary since May 21, 1935, the date of the original secret defense law. I refer to his statement of positions document 2978 PS, USA exhibit number eight. His functions as general plenipotentiary are outlined in the Reich Defense Law of September 4, 1938, which was classified top military secret and appears in our document book as 2194 PS, USA exhibit 36. Under this law of 1938, paragraph 3, tremendous power was concentrated in the hands of Rick as general plenipotentiary for administration. <coughs> he took over the supervision, besides having his Ministry of the Interior, of the Reich Minister of Justice, Reich Minister of Education, Reich Minister for Religious Matters and the Reich Office for Planning. Frick admitted the significant part he played in the preparations for war as a member of this triumvirate in a speech made on March 7, 1940 at the University of Freiburg. Excerpts appear in the document book as 2608 PS which I offer in evidence as USA <coughs> Exhibit 714. I think it would be helpful if the tribunal would allow me to read two short paragraphs beginning at the top of page one of the English translation. Quotation. The organization of the non-military national defense fits organically into the entire structure of the National Socialist Government and Administration. This state of affairs is not exceptional, but a necessary and planned part of the National Socialist order. Thus, 
the conversion of our administration and economy to wartime conditions has been accomplished very quickly and without any friction. Avoiding the otherwise very dangerous chains of the entire structure, it means of the state. And further quotation, the planned preparation, it means of the administration. I'm quoting, for the possibility of a war has already been carried out during the peace. For this purpose, the Führer appointed a plenipotentiary general for the Reich administration and a plenipotentiary general for the economy. Many of, end of quotation. Many of Rick's contributions to the preparation of the German state for war are outlined in detail in the book Dr. Wilhelm Frick and his ministry, which is already in evidence, document 3119 PS. May I quote two short sentences from the top of page three of the English translation. Besides the leading cooperation of the Reich Minister of the Interior in the important field of military legislation, quoting military legislation, and thus in the establishment of our armed forces has to be particularly emphasized. After all, the Reich Minister of the Interior is the civilian Minister of the Defense of the country, who in this capacity, together with the Reich War Minister, not only signed the military law of May 21st, 1935, but in his capacity as Supreme Chief of the General and Inner Administration, as well of the police, he has also received from the Führer and Reich Chancellor important powers in the fields of the replace, replacement system and of military supervision. I have previously mentioned that as Minister of the Interior, Frick was responsible for the administrative policy in occupied and annexed territory. It was his ministry which introduced the new order throughout the vast territory of Europe occupied by the German armed forces and the defendant Frick exercised this power, these powers. I request that the tribunal take judicial notice of three decrees signed by Frick introducing German law into Austria, the Sudetenland, and the Government General of Poland. Decree of March 13, 1938, Reichsgesetzblatt 1938, page 237, Article 8, Document 2307 PS, Decree of October 1, 1938, Reichsgesetzblatt 1938, page 1331, Paragraph 8, Document 3073 PS, and finally, Decree of October 12, 1939, Reichsgesetzblatt 1939, page 2077, paragraph 8, document 3079 PS. Frick Ministry also arranged the selection and assignment of hundreds of occupational officials for the Soviet territory even before the invasion. This fact appears in a report by the defendant Rosenberg of April 1941 on preparations for the administration of occupied territory in the East. May I refer to page 2, paragraph 2? of document 1039 PS, which has previously been introduced as exhibit number 146. One category of Frick's contribution to the planning of 
and preparation for aggressive war deserve special notice. This is a systematic killing of persons regarded as useless to the German war machine, such as insane, crippled and aged, and foreign labors who were no longer able to work. These killings were carried out in nursing homes, hospitals, and asylums. The tribunal will recall that the defendant Frick, the tribunal will recall that the defendant Frick, in his capacity as Reich Minister of the Interior, had jurisdiction over public health and all institutions. May I refer again briefly to the manual for German administrative officials, document 3475PS, this time to pages 3, 4, and 7 of the English partial translation. There, the following are mentioned as Frick's jurisdictional areas, health administration, social hygiene, heredity and racial welfare. Reich plenipotentiary for sanitary and nursing homes. As proof that Frick's jurisdiction covered the death cases in these institutions, I now offer an evidence. Document 621PS, USA Exhibit 715. This is a letter of October 2nd, 1940 from the Chief of the Reich Chancellery, Dr. Lammers, to the Reich Minister of Justice, informing the letter that material concerning the death of inmates of nursing homes had been transmitted to the Reich Minister of the Interior for further action. In fact, the defendant Brick had not only jurisdiction over these establishments, but he was one of the originators of the secret law organizing this murdering. I now offer document 1556PS, USA exhibit number 716. This is an official report dated December 1941 of the Czechoslovak War Crimes Commission entitled Detailed Statement on the Murdering of Ill and Aged People in Germany. I should like to quote very brief excerpts from this report. <coughs> Paragraph 1, 2 and 3 read as follows. The murdering can be traced back to a secret law which was released sometime in the summer 1940. Besides the chief physician of the Reich, Dr. El Conti, the Reichsführer SS Himmler, the Reich Minister of the Interior, Dr. Frick, as well as other men, the following participated in the introduction of the secret law. Other names listed. Three, as I have already stated, there were after careful calculation, at least 200,000 mainly mentally deficient imbeciles besides neurological cases and medically unfit people, these were not only incurable cases and at least 75,000 aged people. The most striking examples of the continued killings in these institutions, which were under Frick's jurisdiction and operated under, under the order of which Frick was a co-author, is the famous Hadamard case. <coughs> Your Honor, may I make a, may I ask you whether I can have 10 more minutes to end this presentation because the chief prosecutor agreed, as I understood, to start tomorrow morning the case of the French. And I have just ten more minutes. Yes, very well. Thank you, Your Lordship.
I say that Frick, I refer back to the Hadamard case, and I say I now offer an evidence. Document number 615PS, USA Exhibit 717, this document I quote this document. For the what, what is this last report? I'm not clear that you spoke about 1556. The last report I spoke about was document 1556 PS. Yeah, whose is it? The Czechoslovak War Crime Commission report. And after I have <coughs> tried to, after I have shown the general scheme of which Frick was a co-author, I like to show that Frick's ministry was acquainted with the things which were going on under his organizational authorship. And therefore, I'm quoting now a letter for the fact that he was acquainted with these killings and that these killings even had become public knowledge. For this reason, I offer an evidence. I offered an evidence, document 615 PS. <coughs> USA exhibit number 717. This document is a letter from the Bishop of Limburg <coughs> of August 13, 1941 to the Reich Minister of Justice. Copies were sent to the Reich Minister of the Interior and the Re which was, this means Frick, and to the Reich Minister for Church Affairs. I quote, about eight kilometers from Limburg, in the little town of Hadamar, on a hill overlooking the town, there's an institution which had formerly served various purposes and of late has been used as a nursing home. This institution was renovated and furnished as a place in which, by consensus of opinion, the above mentioned euthanasia has been systematically practiced for months, approximately since February 1941. The fact has become known beyond the administrative district of Wiesbaden because death certificates from a registry, Hadamar Mönchberg, are sent to home communities. And I quote further, several times a week, buses arrive in Hadamar with a considerable number of such victims. <coughs> School children of the vicinity know these vehicles and say, there comes the murder box again. After the arrival of the vehicle, the citizens of Hadamar watch the smoke rise out of the chimney and are tortured with the ever-present thought of the miserable victims, especially when repulsive odors annoy them, depending on the direction of the wind. The effects of the principles at work are here. Children call each other names and say, you are crazy, you will be sent to the baking oven in Hadamar. Those who do not want to marry or find no opportunity, say marry never, bring children into the world so they can put into the bottling machine. You hear old folks say, don't send me to, to a state hospital. After the feeble-minded have been finished off, the next useless eaters whose turn will come are the old people. Other quotation from this letter, the population cannot grasp that systematic actions are carried out, which in accordance with paragraph 211 of the German criminal code are punishable with death. And I quote finally, officials of the secret state police, it is said, are trying to suppress discussion of the Hadamar occurrence by means of severe threat. In the interest of public peace, this may be well intended, but the knowledge and the conviction and the indignation of the population 
cannot be changed by it. The conviction will be increased with the bitter realization that discussion is prohibited with threats, but that the actions themselves are not prosecuted under penal law. And I quote the last paragraph of the letter, the postscript. I am submitting copies of this letter to the Reich Minister of the Interior and the Reich Minister for Church Affairs, end of quotation, initialed by the above. Nevertheless, the killings carried out in these institutions under the secret law created by the defendant Frick, Himmler and others, continued here after here. I offer an evidence document 3592PS. Was any answer made to that letter? No answer has been found. I offer an evidence. May I come back? I said no answer has been found. I have other letters which I am not able to quote here. Today, the Chancellor remarks, don't answer. I didn't follow that. The Chancellor remarks, please don't answer. Please don't answer. Should be an answer. Nevertheless, the killings carried out in these institutions under the secret law created by the defendant Frick, him like others, continued here after year. I offer in evidence document 3592PS, USA Exhibit 718, which is a certified copy of the charge, specifications, findings, and sentence of the U.S. Military Commission at Wiesbaden against individuals who operated the Hadamas Sanitarium where many Russians and Poles were murdered. In this particular proceeding, seven defendants were charged with the murder in 1944 and 1945 of 400 persons of Polish and Russian nationality. <coughs> and three of these defendants were sentenced to be hanged. The other four were sentenced to confinement at hard labor. Now I come to the last page of my presentation, the final phase of Rick's responsibility, which arises under his position as Reich Protector of Bohemia and Moravia for the period from August 20, 1943 until the end of the war. I think it is not necessary to say anything about the function of the protector of Bohemia and Moravia. But, uh, these, broad you, uh, pa these broad powers are known to the court. Before you pass from 3592 PS, is it clear that that um, trial relates to the killing of Polish and Russian nationalities in uh, nursing homes or institutions of that sort? Who did the killing? Yeah. Is it clear that uh, the uh, document you just referred us to, 3592, relates to a trial of um, German nationals for killing Poles and Russians in nursing homes? Absolutely clear in this document. The sentence of the military commission of Hanama, of Wiesbaden. Well, would you show me where that is? Document number 3592 PS. Char I quote, specification in that Alphonse Klein, Adolf Wahlmann, Heinrich Rohr, Karl Will, Adolf Merkel, Irmgard Huber, and Philipp Luf, acting jointly and in pursuance of a common intent and acting for and on behalf of the then German Reich, 
did from from on or about July 1st, 1944 to on or about April 1st, 1945 at Hadamar, Germany, willfully, deliberately, and wrongfully aid our best and participate in the killing of human beings of Polish and Russian nationality, their exact names and number being unknown, but aggregating in excess of 400, and who were then and there confined by the then German Reich as an exercise of belligerent control. It doesn't say anything about, I mean, it doesn't show that it came within, it doesn't show that it came within the jurisdiction of the Ministry of the Interior. Some time ago, I referred to the administrative manual, to the manual of the German administrative officials, pointing out, this manual points out very clear that nursing homes, sanitaria, and similar state establishments are under the supervision of the Ministry of the Interior. Yes, this I is follow that, but this document doesn't refer to nursing homes. That is what I was asking you. This, yes, they say only Hadamar. It is in fact the Hadamar nursing home. This portion has not been, this portion was not given by the Judge Advocate General, but I am willing to give him later a more extensive document that Hadamar I see. is a common name for the Hadamar so-called Hadamar Killing Mill, which is a I nursing home. Now, I come to the last paragraph of my... No, wait a moment. I come to the last paragraph... Uh, Dr. Kemper, there's some other uh, counsel for the defendants who wishes to speak. There's a gentleman standing by your side there. Rechtsanwalt Pannenbecker, als Verteidiger des Angeklagten Frick. Ich kann aus dem Dokument 3592 PS, aus dem soeben verlesen worden ist, nicht finden, dass irgendwie der Angeklagte Frick äh, mit diesem Dokument in Zusammenhang stehen kann. <lacht> Abgesehen davon... Well, dass uh, Surely, it isn't necessary for you to get up and repeat what I have just said. Ja, ja ich, hatte noch, ich hatte noch etwas zufügen wollen, das nämlich... I beg your pardon? Ich hatte noch hinzufügen wollen, dass der angeklagte Frick seit August 1943 nicht mehr Innenminister war. Und dass auch aus diesem Grunde das Dokument gegen ihn nicht verwertet werden kann. Well, the, this is the date of the trial. It doesn't give the date of the deaths of these people. But at any rate, until uh, uh, Lieutenant Kempler produces uh, uh, something to show that this was at uh, a nursing home and in a time during which the defendant Frick was Minister of the Interior, the tribunal will not treat it as being evidence which Im implicates Frick. This killing in Haramar. I quoted this killing in Haramar for two reasons. First, because, uh, because the Ministry of the Interior has become acquainted as I said before, to the letter of the Bishop of Limbo. In 1941, when Frick was Minister of the Interior, about these facts. And I quoted the military decision for the reason that this killing was still going on in 1944 and 1945 under a law of which Mr. 
the defendant Brick was a co-author. The final phase of Brick's responsibility arises under his position as Reich Protector of Bohemia and Moravia for the period from August 2043 until the end of the war. I have not to prove his function, but I shall mention one example and offer an evidence document number 3589PS. USA Exhibit 720, which is a supplement to an official Czechoslovak report on German crimes against Czechoslovakia. I would like to quote only the following brief passage from this report covering the period when the defendant Frick was Reich Protector of Bohemia and Moravia. I quote, during the tenure of office of defendant Wilhelm Frick as Reich Protector of Bohemia and Moravia from August 1943 until the liberation of Czechoslovakia in 1945, many thousands of Czechoslovak Jews were transported from the Terezin ghetto in Czechoslovakia to the concentration camp at Auschwitz, Team Auschwitz in Poland, and they were killed in the gas chambers. End of quotation. Brought from the territory where Frick was protector to the gas chamber. Thus, we submit. It has been shown that the defendant Frick was a key conspirator from 1923 until the Allied armies crushed the resistance of the Nazi armed forces. Frick's guilt rests on his own record and on the record of his co-defendants for which he is co-responsible under our charter. 